In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of good gifts and giver of life, come and abide in us, cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. I was just chatting with them beforehand. Um, I forgot when I planned this uh, week that um, up until this point, every, the history at least of each week has all come from like one book um, or at least one author. Um, and then this one's all over the place. Uh, partly because this time period is very tumultuous and weird. Um, and so I, I suspect that we have in the three books that we're going to read from today, we probably have up to five or six different authors who composed the three ish books we're going to read from. <laughs> so Lots. And then we're also going to take a pit stop and we're just going to talk about writing the Old Testament and like stuff like that as we get into it. So we have seen Israel get utterly wiped and we have seen Judah now get utterly wiped in exile. Their exiles were slightly different. If we remember, Israel's exile was mostly, it was like remove everybody, settle a bunch of Assyrians. And then they were like, uh, actually, we need some of your priests back. And so... It's part of the like sort of the higher class intellectual class came back in the Northern Kingdom and they made this kind of syncretist, uh, all pan, pan religious kind of kingdom. In the South, it was only the king and the nobles and the court and the priests and the educated stuff like that. They got removed. Average people were always just stayed in the Southern Kingdom. So we have two really different kind of exiles. And here's where we're going to read from. We're going to uh, use the book of Daniel. That's going to be the first one we look at. Um, History-wise, Daniel, the book of Daniel basically starts at the beginning of the exile. That's where we're going to get a lot of that history from. Then, and that's going to be our history of the exile, which lasted about 70 years. Then, from exile ends, and the coming back, which ends the exile, that's going to be from a book, I'm going to call it the Book of Esdras B. And I'll explain that when we get to it. Um, and then um, we're going to jump forward a few hundred years and we're going to look at three of the books of Maccabees. And I'll explain how that's going to look. All of this is, all of this is why every single one of these chunks has a kind of funky... Uh, way that it's set up. And here's the overall pattern I want us to get from this, other than just knowing history. I want to look at, to grossly oversimplify these books, I want to look at four different ways that once the exile happened, one of the big things, one of the big questions that happens is what do we do? Because the law that the Jews are trying to follow, that law assumes several things that are no longer true. One, it assumes that you have a unified place of worship. Well, the temple just got destroyed and the Ark of the Covenant is gone. Number two, it assumes that you are living in the land of Israel. And that is also absolutely not true when you are literally exiled. And number three, it basically assumes a, 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 that, that the Jewish nation is sovereign. That it's, and that's not true either. They don't have a king. They don't like the roles of priest and king are gone. Prophet is about all you're left with. And that's something that gets really latched on to. Especially if we remember that this is the time period where we're going to start writing 
basically all of the Old Testament. This is going to start happening at this point. Up to this point, you have the Torah. And that's it. Um, I shouldn't say that's entirely it. The books around Jeremiah have basically been written. Isaiah has been written. Some parts of it is going to get put together at this time. But basically, when we think of the Old Testament, that didn't exist until the exile. Because you don't have the king, you don't have the priests functioning, really. You just have prophets, and you just have the law and the scripture, and you just have to do something. And so this is when the scriptures actually really take this kind of huge primacy of place in the life of the Jews is when that's actually all there's left. If we remember back to the Southern Kingdom, they didn't even have the book of the law for a long time. They like, they like found it buried underneath a bunch of, of gold. Like they had this, all this other stuff that was supporting the faith and the life of the Jews. But now they have that back and then they've lost everything else. And so now there's kind of this wild swing to this other direction. Um, it's also worth knowing that they had just started celebrating the Passover again for the first time since the days of the judges when the exile happens within a generation. So there's people who still, there are people absolutely still alive at the start of the exile who grew up not celebrating the Passover at all, found the book of the law. That was the big deal. That was the pivotal point in Jewish history. Started doing all the stuff. They're like really following the law now. And then it's just taken away. So that's what's happening to these people. And this is what they're dealing with as they go to exile. So the question becomes, how do you deal with the world? How do you now, as the people of God, having everything taken away from you, and you're living basically only among non-Jews, what do you, how do you interact with them? And I'm going to propose looking at each of these books as kind of portraying, if not, if not proposing, or celebrating, at least portraying, four different ways that the people of God, four different relationships the people of God have with the, the nations, the rest of the people. So we're going to look at Daniel, Esdras B, and then in Maccabees, I'm going to look at two different ways that are kind of together. All right, Daniel. Daniel is one of the great prophets. He's super cool. Um, his book structure is funky, so let me give you that. The core of the book of Daniel is a section. It's, um, it's chapters two through like seven. And that's written in Aramaic, the language of this Babylonian empire. Around that is an intro chapter written in Hebrew and a back half written in Hebrew. And around that is a frame narrative of Greek. That's the book of Daniel. So there's this Aramaic core, this Hebrew expansion, and then this Greek kind of bring it all together. So the Aramaic core is what's sometimes called the court tales. This is where the history happens. This is where I'm gonna focus. And then the Hebrew is like, here's an introduction. And the back half picks up on the last bit of the court tales and then really expands it. And then you've just got this Greek stuff on the outside, which is just kind of like wisdom literature. Um, and we'll talk more about wisdom literature um, next week. But um, it's basically two detective stories on the oh, beginning and back of Daniel, which are very fun. Uh, so here's the court tales. Daniel is very cool. He has three friends. Um, whose Hebrew names I just immediately forgot. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are their like per their like Babylonian names. Uh, and then Daniel's uh, Babylonian name is like Belshazzar. They're very cool. They're very faithful Jews. They are in this kingdom. They're well respected. Daniel is a mystic prophet. And the other three are just super cool. And the Hebrew introdu introduction really establishes how faithful they are. The way that they are being faithful the way that they're answering this question of how do I deal with the fact that I'm gone? Hold to the law. Whatever you do, follow every one of the laws you possibly can. Uh, the way it's brought up specifically, which is nice for us right now, is they're fasting. Or really, they're keeping the dietary laws. 
Um, they're established as being really, really cool. And then you get this structure that uh, is a chiastic structure with some prophecy, some kind of suffering, some kind of persecution, and in the middle it's these dream narratives. And they kind of parallel each other. So you get a prophecy of the succession of kingdoms. Right now you're in this giant kingdom of Babylon, and then you're going to get another, the next kingdom is going to be the Medo-Persian kingdom. They're going to take you down. And then the Greek kingdom is going to take them down. And then the Roman kingdom is going to take them down. And then the Messiah is going to take Rome down. And that's like one of the famous visions of Daniel of the statue that's made out of gold and then silver and then bronze and then clay, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On the back half of the court tales, you get another prophetic vision of a lion and then a bear kills it, and then a winged leopard kills it, and then the beast kills it, and then the son of man kills the beast and is established by the Lord God in an eternal kingdom. So you get these two frame narratives are basically like, here's the rest of history. It is a succession of different kingdoms. What I really want to focus on is that middle part of that core, because you have a point in the beginning, and this is the furnace with the three children that we as Orthodox, like we know this story because it's like all the time. It's like the thing um, from the Old Testament that we harp on all the time. Uh, and you have Daniel and Lion's Den. And these are both times when the either the three friends or Daniel are persecuted for not committing idolatry. They are very faithful. They are persecuted. They are thrown into some danger. God miraculously protects them because of their faithfulness. And because of that miraculous protection, the king who persecuted them ends up actually repenting and acknowledging the power and sovereignty of their God as the God over all the gods. And they're saved. And that king is brought into right relationship with God most high because of their witness. And that's, and then in the middle is these dream narratives. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and his son Belshazzar has a dream. These are the two things there. And the difference there, I want to start there. The difference there, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream and Daniel's the one that's going to interpret it for him. Belshazzar has this dream and Daniel's going to interpret it for him. What ends up happening after these dreams, they're both prophecies against the king of Babylon. They are prophecies that basically say, you have been horrible. You have been utterly wicked. God sees everything, and you're about to lose everything because you have offended God most high. And what ends up happening is that Nebuchadnezzar repents and be and is humbled. Belshazzar does not. He kind of laughs it off. And what ends up happening is that Nebuchadnezzar's life is preserved, and Belshazzar dies that night. And that's this main frame narrative that I want to talk about with Daniel. Daniel is proposing, or at least presenting, this book of Daniel is presenting one way of dealing with the world as the people of God is evangelization. Is to say, all right, I'm not in animosity with humans around me. Our real enemy is demons. Humans are not our real enemy. They are victims of demons. And the foundation of evangelization is, first, holiness. You cannot give what you do not have. You cannot bring someone else into right relationship with God if you are not in right relationship with God. You can't help someone else repent unless you repent. And so Daniel and his friends, they're holding to the law. They are holy. They are good. They are kind. They're all the different things that we expect to see from, like, the good guys in the Old Testament. And when the king is in danger, when the king has these supernatural experiences that he can't explain, and his religion also falls short and cannot explain, who does he turn to? He turns to the pretty obvious saint people. who is just like, oh, Daniel and those other three people are clearly different than everyone else. No one else will be, I will ask them. And so there's this way in which God reveals himself to the king. God reveals himself to the king through the faithfulness of his servants and through their humility. They're not making a big deal out of what's going on. They're just being quietly faithful, 
helpful. They're actually being very, very good servants in the kingdom that they're in. And they're different. They're different than everyone else. And it's obvious. And that's what then draws the people who have finally come to terms with the fact that they have problems that their understanding of the universe doesn't answer. And so they need to find answers somewhere. And so they turn to a group of people who it's like, "Ah, these people look like they might have the answer. And then Daniel actually does. Daniel actually is able to speak from his experience and his knowledge of God into this. The work that Daniel and his friends are doing is a service. The king asks him to do something. He says, yeah, absolutely. 100%. I'll be super helpful. That's like my thing. And the effect of it is that the humble are converted and the proud are destroyed, which is the pattern of the Old Testament. That's a good result. We should expect if we get a result from this that's in congruity with how we know God works, then we should probably say that's that's good. I would say the book of Daniel definitely praises this approach, this approach of quiet holiness, faithfulness to God, a deep and abiding unity with God, drawing in the nations. Book of Daniel is pro-evangelization in this way. And now Daniel's, now when the king shows up and Daniel says, you know, he says, how's my dream? Daniel minces no words. He's not like a pushover. And he's not a syncretist and he's not all these different things. His response is, oh yeah, there's one true God and you've absolutely screwed this up bad. <laughs> and that's why that's why things are going bad for you. But he's merciful. And if you repent, then like, yeah, there's this whole world of like hope and salvation that's available. Um, so he doesn't like, he just certainly does not water down his message by any means, um, but he's not in open animosity with the people around him. He is in open animosity to the demons, but he is not in any way, shape, or form in any form of animosity to the people around him. It is also worth knowing that one of the kings has Daniel come in. Daniel absolutely tells him the message. He has this whole thing, and he uh, still wants nothing to do with God. Humans are humans. They still have free will, even if we theoretically are doing everything right. We are being holy. We are proclaiming God's message when called upon. We're doing all the things. Um, We should still expect that the world doesn't want that message. We should not be surprised when, even though we experience Christianity, even though we experience God in ways that, that if we're living this life out, it becomes obvious to us that, like, yeah, this is what's going on. This is how the world works. Um, no matter how obvious it is to us, there is something about the fact that it's only obvious if you're humble. Throughout all of Scripture, the proud constantly reject God. Constantly. Um, and so we shouldn't really be surprised when orthodoxy is rejected. Because that's theoretically the norm throughout history. Um, is that actually most people aren't immediately drawn towards something that requires humility and death to self. Um, And we should be really careful about ourselves ever growing hostile to orthodoxy because that's a sign that there's something wrong with us. Um, And that's, you know, we've talked about how God works with to get us to repent as he allows evils to happen to us to wake us up. At the end of all of this, um, you get a whole bunch of apocalyptic visions. I'm going to skip all of them because it, it's here's the rest of history for all of time. You may read the book of Daniel if you want to get into that. But they're, they're in that kind of that Hebrew hug around the Aramaic core. The Aramaic core is what I want to focus on here. And then you get two detective stories, which is great <laughs> at the beginning and end in the Greek. So that's... Basically, Daniel, as I want to present it in 20 minutes. Questions about Daniel or about this, uh, this pattern, this, this, uh, this evangelization pattern of Daniel. Okay. 
Daniel lives through basically the whole exile. It's about 70 years. The end of the exile happens, and the book that we're going to read, for the book that I read and now I'm going to tell you about, is called Esdras B, or Second Esdras. Here is a quick lesson on what is this book. So, you have probably heard this book referred to as the two books of Ezra and Nehemiah. That is how it is almost always put in an English Bible. It's two books, one called Ezra, one called Nehemiah. They tell one story. There you go. I'm calling it the second book of Esdras because that's more traditional in the Orthodox tradition. But then you're like, the second one? What's the first book of Esdras? Well, the first book of Esdras is also the book of Ezra, slightly, slightly tweaked in different areas. That one's also in our Bible. <laughs> um, so if you look at, say, the Orthodox Study Bible, uh, you'll get to uh, First Chronicles and Second Chronicles, which is basically First and Second Kings, or also known as Third and Fourth Kingdoms. And then you get to Esdras A, or First Esdras, and that starts with the first... Oh, I'm going to try and get this correct. The start of that book is the same as... The first, the last two chapters of Second Chronicles, word for word, identical. So theoretically, if you're reading cover to cover, you get to the last, you get to Josiah, the King Josiah, who finds the law and does all this stuff. And then you get to the thing and you're like, King Josiah. And it is word for word, the exact same text for two chapters. And then you get the whole book of Ezra. But like every so often, a small detail is like changed. And then you get up with that book, and then and, and then you get to Esdras B, which starts with the last two verses of Second Chronicles again. And then you get the book of Ezra in the version we're more comfortable, we're more like familiar with, which is slightly different from how the exact same story was just proposed. And then you get Nehemiah. And then you read a little bit more, and then it's all the Sinner Scriptures. And then you find out there's a third Esdras. And then you find out there's a fourth Esdras. And it just, welcome to this part of the history part of the Bible is kind of all over the place as far as texts. Esdras A and Esdras B are in our canon. Esdras C and D are not. But they're all these like really related texts and things, like all written by different authors, except for sometimes they're just the same. But there's a lot going on. I'll get into that more when I get into the like, here's how the Bible happened. <laughs> but Ezra and Nehemiah, that's what we're going to talk about. Ezra's B, also known as the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. This charts the return of exiles back to the land of Judah. Remember that the exile has just taken place for 70 years. That means these kinds of people exist. You still have people living in the land of Judah. They were not upper class. They were alive when the temple was still around and got destroyed and the exile happened. And they're still alive now as exiles start coming back. That's one kind of person that exists in this story. You also have Jews who were born in Judah during the exile. They have never known a temple, but they've always lived in the land. You have people who were alive when the temple was there, watched it get destroyed, then got exiled, and are now coming back and have lived through all of that. That's a third kind of person that exists. And a fourth kind of person exists. You've guessed it. It's people born in Babylon, in exile, who are now coming back. There's technically other kinds of people, and I'll mention them briefly, but they're not going to be as important to this. You also have people that just stay in Babylon and never come back. You also have people that are in other diaspora, Egypt. There's like a whole Egyptian diaspora that's also going on. So, like, you've got all sorts of different kinds of Jews. So, when we get to seeing this history develop, when we walk into the New Testament, 
one of the lessons from this part of history is to remember that there isn't a thing called Judaism that existed when Jesus showed up. There were legitimately Judaisms, plural. And they tend to be generally associated with these different kinds of experiences of the exile. The Pharisees tend to be an exiled group. And because they were exiled, they had no temple, they didn't have the land, so the scripture becomes their like thing. They invent synagogues while they're in Babylon, and they bring synagogues back. And so studying the word of God as like the primary thing, that's an exile thing. That's, that's not pre-exile. Again, remember, they're, they also wrote the Old Testament, <laughs> which did not exist before the exile, really. I mean, you had the Torah, but like all of the history books we've read since the Torah did not exist until someone else wrote them after the exile. So that's one group. You have the Sadducees, and they're basically, once they built the second temple, they're like the priest group from the second temple who obviously didn't exist until there was a second temple, really. You also have the Essenes, and no one knows anything about them, basically, other than they're this kind of weird, mystic, semi-monastic, very hostile to all other forms of Judaism group that live in caves. Then you have normal people who have just... They've never been to the temple except for the once-a-year thing, and they were farmers. And then one day they heard Jerusalem got destroyed. And their lives didn't really change that much because they didn't live in Jerusalem. They, wa- they visited there once a year. Now they go to Jerusalem once a year. Or they don't because there is no temple there. And then, and then people came back and built another temple and they were just like, great. Fundamentally, their life just kind of kept going. And they, you know, they didn't, you know, this. And so you have all these different types of Judaism that are showing up. And we'll meet a fifth kind of Judaism a little bit later. They're called the Zealots. We'll meet them a little bit later. Anyway, so three big waves happen. You have a wave that comes back with Zerubbabel, a wave that comes back with Ezra, and a wave that comes back with Nehemiah. Zerubbabel's wave builds the new temple. Ezra's new wave reinstates the Torah and the law very strictly. And the third wave rebuilds the walls around Jerusalem. Temple, law, walls. That's your big thing. This, uh, I'll just start, Ezra's B is a really sad book. If you've never read Ezra D.M.I. before, before, um, it's really sad. <laughs> kind of the whole time. Um, so Zerubbabel comes back. He brings thousands of exiles back. They're going to rebuild this temple. And they get to Jerusalem and they start rebuilding the temple. And the people in the area start saying, we would love to help you build the temple. We've been worshiping your God this like whole time. Which if we're coming in from Old Testament, we're thinking it worked. Right? It worked. That was what was supposed to happen. The nations were supposed to see God and the people of God living that way, we're thinking Book of Daniel. We're like, it's the, it's happening. And what does Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel say? Our God's not for you. You're some foreign. No, you're the, you're the weird people. No, get out of our temple. There is no God here for you. This is our God. This is our temple. It's for us. And so they build the temple. And nobody around them likes it. But they they have a temple, so that's cool. Um, Fun fact, when they build the new temple and they dedicate it, guess who doesn't come to the dedication? God. (laughs) The cloud of glory that descended upon the temple when it was built. No, no. No cloud of glory. No. All the people who lived in Jerusalem before the exile happened, they've seen the old temple. And now they see the second temple. None of them come to the new temple. They don't like it. There's actually this weird, this is weird passage um, where as the foundation stones are being laid for the temple, there are screams of sorrow and joy from these two different groups of Jews. The Jews that had seen the old temple are weeping. And the Jews that have just come back from Mecca are cheering. 
but it's all just one big scream and you can't tell the difference. It's this really weird little passage. Um, so that's fun. So in the next story, uh, Ezra. So we, so we go back to Babylon and we meet this guy named Ezra. He's a priest, he's super into the law, and he gets permission to bring some people back and reinstate the laws. So he comes to Jerusalem and he starts to rebuild this community. He, he has a copy of the law that he has handwritten himself. He gets all the people together and he just stands there and he just reads the whole Torah. Cover to cover. Or the book of Deuteronomy. It's not entirely clear what he's reading. I, and I have really no idea. I'm going to, I'm going to work on the, the assumption that it's the whole Torah. But actually, it could have just been the book of Deuteronomy. I really don't know. Fine. Anyway, I'm going to say he read the whole Torah because that's, that's a much longer day. And I think it, I think it makes the point better. So, and then what ends up happening is that there's people there and he's reading this whole big law. And if you remember what the point of the law was, was you have God in the center. You have the people who are closest to God. You have the next shell, the next shell. And it's all these different concentric shells of people who are more like God, less like God. And the point is to be drawing people in. And one of the most important laws is don't worship demons. It's a big deal. Well, one of the classic ways that people start worshiping demons in the Old Testament is when they marry non-Jews. And instead of bringing that person into the covenant, they get pulled away from it. Well, that's what's happening in this new Jerusalem, which has like a temple with no God in it, but it has a temple. Um, and so Ezra gets like really into this whole, like everyone has to divorce all of their wives. All wives must go if they're not Jewish. No real concern with whether or not they've become Jewish or not. If you're not ethnically Jewish, then the Jewish God isn't for you. The Jewish temple is not for you. You may not live in Jerusalem. And some of the Jews agree. And some don't. And then the book of Ezra ends. Okay. So we have a temple that doesn't necessarily do all the things it's supposed to do. We have a law and we're kind of following it. Um, and, and those of us who are following it are kind of following it for the right reasons. Kind of. Book of Nehemiah shows up. Um, we go back to Babylon. <laughs> There's this guy named Nehemiah. He's very cool. He's like, right, he's the cup bearer of the king of Babylon. So he's like really high up in the court. He gets permission to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So he goes back and his big thing is he gets all the different tribes of the Jews to go and like take different pieces of the walls and they're all going to build up their little sections and stuff like that. And what ends up happening is you have um, the, the, you, you have the people who live there who are now getting, they, you know, they're getting systematically kind of pushed out of Jerusalem if they're not Jewish and if they're, frankly, not the right kind of Jewish, according to that. Because again, the people who've been living in Jerusalem this whole time are also kind of on the chopping block for getting pushed out of Jerusalem. They're like not real Jews. Um, and so this wall is being built and everyone's kind of making fun of them for it because the walls aren't very good. Um, <laughs> frankly, they don't build very good walls, uh, which I find hilarious. But anyway, because they spent like a while on it. Um, so they built like frankly, pretty bad walls. Um, and everyone around him was just kind of like, I mean, even if I wanted to get into your city, if I tried to climb this wall, I think it would fall down. I don't, like, these are, they're one of the, yeah. So they're like, and, um, so, so they, they like build the walls again. They're not very good walls and no one likes them. Um, then you get this cool thing. We're like, okay, we're going to reestablish the covenant. Ezra and Nehemiah are both there. And 
they're like, okay. And they get all the people and they like go to the altar and they're like going to do the blood thing. They're going to do like all the covenant stuff that Moses did. And they do all this thing and they like proclaim all these laws. Da, 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 da. <sighs> Finally. And they stand there in their temple that may not actually be that cool of a temple and they're definitely presence of God's not there. And they've got this law that they're kind of following and they're going to like do the covenant, but kind of, and most people are kind of like, yeah, I guess. Ezra and Nehemiah are really into it, but everyone else is going to be fine. And they're surrounded and they like look around and they look at their city and it's like still kind of broken and beat up and the walls are like, and, like I can imagine they look out and like one of the walls like falls down like while they're looking at it. That's the book of that's the book of Second Esther, and then Nehemiah takes a grand tour of the city. He's gonna he's gonna look around the city, and what he finds is um they've put they've put a pagan idol in the temple already. It's been like two years. Um, yeah, I know, right? And they they've um, they don't they don't actually have the incense. They don't have the right incense. Um, and then he's looking around and. People aren't following the Sabbath, like, at all. Every Sabbath, markets are, like, constantly going on in Jerusalem. Um, they're, you know, all this stuff. And and then he, like, goes to the walls. And the walls weren't that good to begin with. But now there's people who have, like, built, like, little, like, huts leaning against the... Like, it just... It's just so sad. <laughs> if you ever read the book of Ezra's B, like, you just... It's just, like, bummer after bummer after bummer. And... Here's the here's the play. Here's what they're what are they trying to do? They're trying to be the nation of Israel, different from everybody else, and everybody else has to get out and they're they're ghettoing themselves. It's this isolation model, it's this seclusion model. We get to go back and we get to be faithful to God. And it's all about us. And it's all about being the right kind of Jewish. And it's all about and, and we to get to decide what that is. And we'll build the temple the way we think it should be built. And we're going to do the law the way we think we should do the law. And we're going to build the wall. And like, and they keep building this like giant edifice um, that frankly is a little, it's Tower of Babel-ish. It's, it's very much like there's the oneness of language. There's the oneness of people. There's the big monument they were building. And there's no God there. No one prays to God for the entire book of Esdras B, basically. The closest you get is these weird interpolations where you get this kind of thing where the writer says something like, God, forgive us. As he's like going through this book. Um, and it's this, it's this, I think, I'm not convinced that this book picks a side necessarily. Um, it's just kind of presenting that this is this is what happened. Um, depends which part of the book. Parts of the book seem to take a side, part of the book doesn't seem to. It's kind of this funky bit. Um, the foundation of this is judgment. The foundation of this is is being in and out of the covenant and who's in and who's out and making sure that that's all correct. And the fundamental work of it is to divide. But there's there's something about in the old in the real part of the old covenant. Um, it was about making distinctions, but the distinctions were always distinctions meant to be overcome. You have the concentric circles of holiness, and the idea was for people to, to, to make it into more part. This one is not about that. This one is about setting up the distinction, and it's this permanent thing. Um, and the effect is that basically... I don't know. Sometimes when we, sometimes we earn ourselves a bad reputation. <laughs> um, and I would say, are there Orthodox who think this way about the Orthodox Church? Absolutely. It's called uh, ethnophilatism. It's a heresy. It was condemned at a council. Um, but the idea that like, you know, you go to like, say you go to like a Russian parish and you go there and, and you're like, okay, and you want to convert to Orthodox or whatever, and you get there, or like a Serbian parish, or a Greek parish, or an Albanian parish, or frankly, an American parish, or whatever. And you get there, and you're whatever, and then you talk to the priest, and they're just like, you're not. 
You're not Serbian. Why would you want to join our church? You're not Greek. Why? This is a Greek church. Or this is a Russian. Like that idea that like the church is for us. It's our church. And it's for us to be different in our own little thing and to be better than everyone else. It's fine. It's great. And that's in fact what it's for. That's a heresy. <laughs> um, that's not just a bad idea. That's full on condemned at a council. Don't do that. Any parish that is not built for the sake of worshiping God and bringing people in is a parish that is breaking the commandments of God. All right. Yeah. Wouldn't that just like totally contradict any church calling itself like holy yes. Catholic? Yes. Because like, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, yeah. It's a full on absolute flip of what ecclesiology is. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is, it's a truly horrific place to be. Um, yeah. Okay. Any questions on Esdras other than why is it so sad all the time? <laughs> I just kept thinking about like, all, like we're saying, just like you're saying just now, other Christian, Christian churches. Yeah. And it's like, they all have their own little, yeah. And it just made me think, or, or when you're talking about the new temple and how the people of the old one were like, ah, oh, and I'm like, I just laughed to like being in like Salt Lake City and being like, <laughs> Oh, there's that temple over there that's makes like cringe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's reading through these books. I was just kind of like reading through, it and I was just like, "Oh, this isn't like this isn't like a happy week." Like all of these books are so sad. Daniel's cool, and then it stops being cool really quick. All right, Maccabees. Let's talk about Maccabees. There are four books of Maccabees. We care about three, three or four of them. So first and second Maccabees are in our scriptures, pretty much for sure. Third Maccabees is like on the edge. Fourth Maccabees is like super on the edge, depending on how you feel about it. Um, here's what they do. First Maccabees tells the story of the Maccabean revolt. Big portion of history. Second Maccabees tells this part of it. Third Maccabees takes place way over here in Egypt for no good reason. And then fourth Maccabees is one conversation of second Maccabees. That's how this is framed. So basically the Greeks, they're in charge and they put up this abomination of the temple. They put up an idol to one of the Greek gods into the temple. And then there's a giant revolt. And this way of dealing with the world, war. That is how they decide to handle the other nations is to go to war absolute enmity and not really about, I mean, it is about demon stuff. There, there are ups and downs. Um, but this is, again, this is the Ezra and Nehemiah community that they've built. So this is that very like ethnophilic kind of like, it's about Jews and it's about us being able to have our temple and all these different things. That's what they're fighting for in this way. Um, worth knowing one, now we're in a book that Jews don't consider scripture. So we're already at that point. Number two, the Maccabees aren't like remembered fondly by Jews. Like they're not the good guys in Jewish history necessarily. I'm told, I actually have never asked a Jew about this, but I, in my reading about this, I was like, yeah. And then, and then I was reading that and I was like, oh, they don't even like the Maccabees. They're not like heroes in the, like the Judas Maccabeus and things like that. Um, first Maccabees tends to paint them, the Maccabees in a pretty good light. Second Maccabees tends to not. So even the two books are presenting like different ways of viewing this Judas Maccabeus. And then Jonathan Athis and Simon Fassi are these other leaders of that. So I'm gonna mostly focus on second Maccabees and first Maccabees. First Maccabees is war. I would say the big difference is, are you looking at the world with worldly eyes or spiritual eyes? The worldly-eyed people are like, this is our land. It is about the land. It is about the temple. It is about our earthly lives. That's what we're defending and fighting for. And then you have all these martyrs who don't fight back. They just get martyred. But they get willingly martyred. They don't fight back. They're just like, I'm faithful to God. I'm not worried about what's going to happen to me next. You can kill my body, but you can't kill my soul. 
That's where we're at. And that's the famous story of the seven Maccabean brothers and their mother, who are wildly praised by, like, everybody. Whereas, like, the, the actual, like, revolters are not necessarily actually, like, popular. Um, the work of the war, people, is murder. They're just killing humans. Like, that's their big thing. The martyrs are patiently enduring and praying for the people that are killing them. Their goal is to get their enemies into right relationship with God. The goal of the warriors, I think, um, anybody here ever seen Hamlet? Okay, there's this famous scene in Hamlet where, so he wants to kill his uncle because his uncle killed his dad. There's the there's scene one of Hamlet. There's this famous scene in Hamlet where he sees his uncle praying and it's just him and his uncle and his uncle doesn't know he's there. And you remember how like David's in the cave and he could have killed Saul. It's absolutely that kind of a scene. And he has this monologue where he says, I could kill him right now, but that wouldn't avenge my father because if he prays and I kill him now, Do what? Send my father's murderer straight to heaven? He does not deserve that. No, I must find him when he is gambling and drinking and defiling the marriage bed. I must find him then and kill him and send him to the flames that he deserves. Hamlet's goal is he wants his uncle to go to hell. So much so that he can't stand the idea of his uncle repenting and getting to go to heaven. That's the mindset of these Maccabees. No, 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 it's not about bringing the nations in. It's about making darn sure every single one of those humans goes to hell where they deserve. That's that mindset. Whereas the martyrs are like, no, no, no. Demons suck. We're all the victims of the demons. It is about getting, like, it is, it is, a, it's more like what we see with Daniel in the lion's den. It's more like what we see with the three children in the furnace. They walk into their suffering with faith in God and they just say, glory to God. No, I'm not going to fight you back because that would be me harming someone. Then I wouldn't be worthy to call myself faithful to God because then I would become just like you are. And both of us would fall to the demons. We would both become murderers. But that's not helpful. That's giving that is letting the demons win. Vengeance is God's. Famous line in the scriptures. Vengeance is God's. Let him deal with what to do with stuff. We don't take revenge. Revenge is absolutely forbidden to Christians. What happens? What's the effect? What's the, what's the overall effect from the Maccabees War? Lots of people die. And the Jews stay enslaved. And that's it. What's the effect of the martyrs? They have eternal life. I mean, that's the difference. The death or life. That's this fundamental difference that happens between those two different ways of looking at this. And different ways of living it out. All right. Any questions about Maccabees? Why did the Jews not view like Judas Maccabees favorably? Yeah, uh, if I'd have read any more than just that sentence, it'd just been like fascinating and then moved on <laughs> because I had to, I just had to look at it. I just had to read so many things. Um, I, I think there's like, there's like real questions about the legitimacy of the priesthood that they established in the temple. There's like real, legi- they're not Davidic, so they can't be the king. Like there's, so there's like real, there's like real problems with like, this doesn't follow the prophecy. Like he's kind of playing Messiah and not fulfilling the prophecies correctly. There's some of that for sure. That's actually probably the major thing. Um, on the other hand, he's not a good person. No one should probably like him. <laughs> um, so things like that. Um, yeah, I didn't bring this up. Daniel's got this prophecy of the weeks, the so many, so many weeks of years of things like that. Um, so it's the wrong time. So frankly, it's just not the right time. Um, fun fact, when was the right time? Well, it's around it's around when Jesus showed up. There's a reason, actually, if you read the New Testament carefully, you'll find that there's references to the fact that there are other people who also claimed to be the Messiah around the time that Jesus showed up. 
That was actually kind of common. It was like the cool thing to do was to be the Messiah. Um, because people knew that that was the time period it was going to happen. That Daniel's prophecy was like, they were like checking their watches and they were like, yeah, this is like Messiah time. Um, right after Jesus, you get the Bar Kokhba rebellion. The Bar Kokhba rebellion is really famous. That's, uh, that's around the time period that the temple gets destroyed. And he's like, there's people who think that he's like the Messiah. And he's like, I'm going to be the Messiah that like is the warrior king that fights off Rome. He's like, he is being what everyone like thought Jesus was going to do. And then Jesus utterly disappointed them by being the real Messiah. Um, Bar Kokhba is like, yeah, yeah, that's me. I'm the real Messiah. Like, and he, and he attacks Rome and he fails, but it's why this time period are there so many people? Well, yeah, that's when the prophecy was supposed to get fulfilled was around that time period. So again, everybody knew that. Um, all right. Any que- any other questions about Maccabee stuff? Uh, until I do a really quick like Old Testament happened. Okay. So this is around the time period that you get basically the whole Old Testament, other than the Torah, is written in and around the sermon. We don't really know a lot of the details on it, but I just want to take a moment to talk about a difference in our understanding of the canon than your typical Western Christianity. Typical Western Christianity, to grossly oversimplify anything that they believe, is if it's in the Bible, then it's all on the same level. Bible. And if it's outside the Bible, it's all on the same level. Not Bible. And that's not really a historically accurate way of viewing things if we look at the first century. Uh, Pulling a lot off of uh, Athanasius, St. Athanasius the Great. Uh, Letter 39, um, if you ever look up his letters, it's letter number 39. He talks about this. He talks about scripture and he talks about how there's canon, what he calls canon in Greek, which means measuring rod, anagignoscomena. Why he couldn't just pick uh, an easier word than that in Greek will baffle everyone forever. And then what he calls apocrypha. And, and I'll say if you Google now apocrypha, what he called the anagignoscomena is what is now typically referred to as apocrypha. And what he called apocrypha is just like not Bible. <laughs> Full on weird. Um, that's like the Gospel of Thomas. So, so canon. And he identifies the Old Testament with 22 books. Partly it's because Ezra and Nehemiah, one book. First and Second Samuel, one book. First and Second Kings, one book. First and Second Chronicles, one book. And the 12 minor prophets, one book. That's how you get from like, it's like 60. Well, it's like 22, <laughs> depending on how he's counting it. And these would all be individual scrolls. So he's just saying, yeah, you've got like a Genesis scroll next. Like if you want an Old Testament, you need 22 books. The Anagignoscomena is like the Book of Tobit and Wisdom and Sirach and uh, for, actually he doesn't mention the Maccabees, um, but like it's kind of it's a lot of the books we're going to talk about next week, and he calls them Anagignoscomena, which is to say they're not canon, but they're good to read. Other books that are basically in this category are the Maccabean books. Um. And depending on who you ask, this could be Enoch and Jubilees. Um, some books that we never even print with our Bibles. Uh, the Prayer of Manasseh, Psalm 151, Esther, Judith, these kinds of things. Um, and then you have the, the Apocrypha, which is like the Gospel of Thomas and stuff like that. Uh, oh, the Didache is one of the books he straight up mentions as one of the Anagignoscomena, is the Didache, which we, it, he even lists as one of these things, and we don't print it with our Bibles, and that's fine. Um, the Letters of Ignatius of Antioch are sometimes considered Anagignoscomena, the Shepherd of Hermas, the Epistle of Barnabas, stuff like that. We have a different view of scripture insofar as even within the canon, there's a hierarchy. One of the fundamental realities that we hold to as revealed by God is that everything is everything exists in hierarchical relationships. Everything. And we see this, and I'm going to especially bring up scripture, and it's, and it's this language that Jesus is using of head and body is one of these like big ways of presenting this. In the canon of the Old Testament, 
the head of the canon of the Old Testament is the Torah. And the rest of the Old Testament is the body of the Torah, in a sense. It's how the Torah is fleshed out and effective. If you were just a head, you would, one, be very bad at running track. And number two, very bad at everything else, <laughs> including living. But if you were also just a body, you would never pass algebra two and you would die. So problems, the head needs the body, the body needs the head, but the head can't do everything on its own, even though it's in charge. It's in, it's, it's in charge as a member of the body. It is not separate from the body. It is a member of the body. It just happens to be the head member, etc. Paul goes into this a lot when he talks about body of Christ stuff. So you have the Torah. Okay, well, what comes after the Torah? You have what, uh, what lots of people call the Deuteronomistic history. Basically, all the books we've talked about. <laughs> Joshua, Judges, Kingdom, Kingdoms, Kingdoms, Kingdoms. And Ruth, which we didn't talk about. That's fine. Um, that's the Deuteronomistic history. Then what else do you have? Well, then you have First and Second Chronicles. All the Esdras stuff. And then you have the major prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Baruch, the letter of Jeremiah and the Lamentations, um, Daniel, Ezekiel. Then you have the minor prophets. And then you have like Esther and like some of these like Job. And then, oh, and then you have like uh, kind of the wisdom, which is the Psalms and Job. So like you have these different kind of parts of the Old Testament. And those parts are meaningful to how much authority how seriously we take those parts of the Old Testament. Not how true they are. We do believe that all of this is true. I mean, all of this is fundamentally very different from like not scripture. But I didn't even like read anything from the books of Chronicles because they're not on the same level as the four books of Kingdoms. They're good, but they're not on the same level. I did, didn't even bring up the book of Ruth. It's, it's kind of off on its own. There's different levels of the Old Testament. And the way I want to talk about it is there's two ways to look at this, authority and readability. And what I mean by those is authority, how close to the head is it? How much is it, how core is it? Or how close to the edge is it? And the main thing I want to talk about is readability. The closer something is to the head, the closer to the core, one of the ways that we talk about that is it's how safe it is for someone to read, just like on their own. Um, we consider the Torah, great. Basically, you can just hand the Torah to someone. Nowadays, that's really tough because everyone has learned how not to read a book correctly. Uh, and the Torah is really hard to read um, for modern people now. But for most of history, people were like, yeah, read the Torah. That's great. Read the Psalms. That's great. Maccabees? I don't know. First Maccabees is kind of weird because it seems to glorify these people that we don't actually like. The New Testament's the same way. Gospels. And then you've got like Acts of the Apostles. And then you've got like the letters. And then, like, Revelation's way down the bottom, as far as how safe it is to read. Again, all scripture. And then you've got, like, the non-canonical stuff. But we're running out of time, so I won't go to that. But I just want to give you an idea. When we talk about the canon of scripture, as we're getting close to wrapping up the Old Testament, um, like everything, it's more complicated than just Bible, not Bible. Um, and I bring that partly because we talk about the book of Maccabees. It's weird. I don't actually necessarily recommend reading the book of 1 Maccabees until you actually have a really good idea of what's going on. Um, whereas I'd be like, read Daniel, Daniel's great. Stuff like that. So, Vespers is about to start. Good to go? Cool.